Welcome to Restaurant Influencers. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue Media. Today's episode is brought to you by Entrepreneur Media and Yelp. Uh, our primary presenting sponsor is Toast, which is our primary point of sale partner. We're grateful that all of these people have come together to allow us this stage um, in life and in the restaurant business, we learn through lessons and stories. And today's guest is Joelle Parento. I found her on Medium. Medium is a blogging article. Um, she is a restaurant owner and she is here to share her story. Joelle, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much. So I've got a random question to start the show. I'd like to know where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Oh, wow. Good question. Um, so if you were to look from just a pure like stadium architectural standpoint, um, I have been to a game at Camp Nou in Barcelona, which is just massive. So just sheer scope. But if you look at it from an experience ambiance, once you're inside perspective, um, if you haven't been to a Vegas Golden Knights game in Vegas, okay, <laughs> that is, is next, next level. Just the production of it, the, the energy in there is just nuts. Okay, well, let's go with Vegas Golden Knights, even though I'm a huge fan of Barcelona, I studied in Spain. Uh, let's go with the Golden Knights in Vegas, and let's pretend that I somehow convince entrepreneur Yelp and Toast to put on a hospitality conference. And at this hospitality conference, we get a bunch of restaurant owners, hospitality professionals, everybody that wants to up their game with digital content, improve their business. And I give you center stage. I give you the mic and say, oh, wow. two minutes, tell us your story. Can you do it? Um, I mean, two I'm minutes, 120 seconds, 120 <laughs> yeah, seconds. Yeah. 20 seconds. Um, 120 seconds. You get 120. You're good. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Yeah. So okay. two minutes, two minutes. Yeah. You're asking if I can do it or you asking um, me to do it. I'm right asking now? you to do it right now. You <laughs> do it right now. All right. So I uh, am the owner of a really cute little Berlin street food shop called Wolf Down. We specialize in Berlin donors and you know, to most, most North Americans, that is, they're not super familiar with it. Um, but it's best way to describe it is as kind of a cousin to the gyro shawarma. Um, they all have a common ancestry dating back to the Ottoman empire. You see the meat on the, you know, the rotating skewer also kind of commonality with tacos al pastor, but basically take all that, put a Turkish German twist on it. And you've got something pretty, pretty unique. And I fell in love with it after falling in love with a German boy who <laughs> <laughs> brought me to Germany. And um, he hyped up this food so much. I, I'd never heard of it. And I was like, can't possibly be this good. No one's heard of it. Um, <laughs> and of course I had my first bite and I was just mind blown being like, wait, how did you guys keep this a secret from us for so long? And like, how do we not already have this all over? Um, so the, of course the entrepreneur in me with no inclination previously to open a restaurant was like, I guess I got to open a donor shop because it's the only way I'm going to eat it. And here we are. And here we are. And where, and where are you at, at the current stage of your business? How many restaurants were you guys located? What, what's going on? So uh, we have a bit of an unusual growth trajectory. <laughs> it's a little personalized. Uh, so I live, my hometown is Ottawa. I live here, uh, Ottawa, Canada. So we opened the first one here, of course, for ourselves. Um, and then we decided it was a brilliant idea to open the second location in Las Vegas of all places, which seems random. I mean, we're going Canada, US, East Coast, West Coast. Um, but my, my husband and I actually happen to also be part-time poker players. Hence the Vegas connection. It's kind of where we spend the second most time, um, also just kind of getting a little bit over uh, Canadian winters. So we've actually just decided to buy uh, a lot in Vegas to spend the winters there. So it's kind of our second home. So for and and a lot of our investors and friends in Vegas were just like, you got to bring this here. So, you know, I'm like, OK, I got you. <laughs> there you go. And then uh, and then we just opened um, just kind of jumping into the ghost kitchen game as well. So we just opened a couple in Toronto and one in Calgary, and we're looking to expand more that way. That's awesome. So we, we also have two ghost kitchens. I'd love for you to explain to the listeners. Um, I know we have a lot of restaurant owners, but ghost kitchens are a hot button topic. What, what are they? So they're basically a virtual kind of delivery take, not always take out in most cities, but, but let's say a delivery only kind of kitchen. So, you know, customers ordered just through Uber Eats, DoorDash, Skip, uh, I guess those are different names here here in Canada, yeah. but um, 
so it's the idea of you, you don't have a, a physical storefront, so it's, it's completely virtual in that sense, but at the same time, the, the advantage is that you, you know, your operational costs, your upfront costs, a lot of this can be much more streamlined. And yeah, it's a kind of a delivery play. So the reason why uh, we're so interested in this podcast, we're so excited to meet people like you, people all over the globe, is that you know the digital world, what we hope people take away from this podcast is that you know every person that is in the restaurant space, in the hospitality space, they have a unique story. And we have the technology that enables us to share that story should we choose to do so. Um, you and I connected because of Medium, which is a blogging website. Uh, you wrote an article, Why Restaurants Are So Fucked. Yeah. Um, you wrote a follow-up to that article, which also came into my inbox um, just recently, Why Restaurants Are So Fucked, Part 2. Uh, why did you do that? And what was the response that you received after the first uh, the, the first, first article that you wrote? So um, the first one, I'm, I'm not someone who's like a full-time blogger who's really into this. I really just, <laughs> the, the first one was basically just a rant of just stuff that I had to get off my chest. And the timing of that was just kind of at the start of COVID. So just seeing some of the things we were going through and how we were struggling. So the first one was mostly focused on the lack of understanding of just kind of how all the costs add up in the industry and, and uh, my frustration at um, the lack of appreciation or understanding for like how, what it all takes to serve you a, a, a great meal. You know, yeah. I, the one thing I can't stand is when people are like, well, I could buy all these ingredients at the store for less. And you're like, that's, that's not the point. Correct. Um, and I also feel like I had, I had the advantage of writing it from a place of, I was, I was brand new to this industry. I never ended up to, you know, anticipated being in this industry. So I had, you know, just a year before been that quote unquote, like customer who had no clue. And then I just kind of entered behind the scenes and was like, whoa, like even I, I, I have a grasp for business, but even I didn't um, fully anticipate or appreciate all these extra costs that, yeah. that go into play, you know, whether it's you know, paying for waste management or grease trap servicing and all these things that um, the, the average consumer just, just wouldn't know. It's not their fault. They, they're not behind the scenes. So I just wanted to shed some light on that to help explain why um, restaurant food costs what it costs. And that, you know, there's also that there's great people working behind the scenes and they deserve a lot better than what they're getting. Um, and so that, that was kind of the, the gist of the first one. And it seemed to really open a lot of eyes. And I was really pleased at the response of people just, you know, taking it in and being like, wow, I had no clue, but thank you. And I appreciate that now. And um, so that post kind of just, overnight went viral out of nowhere and which was totally not what I over millions of views correct yeah and and I ended up doing podcasts all over the world um so so that just just like we're doing right now just the yeah. connection from that was was really really cool and um you know it actually really helped because that that was when we were just in in lockdowns and COVID so I was kind of going stir crazy so it kind of helped me to to keep talking to people um now the follow-up was spurred on by this, the stage that we're at right now in the pandemic of, we all thought the vaccines were gonna save us, things were looking better. We kind of finally saw that light at the end of the tunnel and yet it just seems like we can't get there. And at the same time, what we're seeing happen simultaneously with that is that at the start of COVID, people were, were pretty empathetic and you know people were supportive and but like now everybody's tired and yeah. everybody's just so done with it that we, I feel like that, that kind of compassion is starting to fade and people are starting to get a little bit edgier and you match that with the way the reopening was, was done where it was just like, Oh, you guys can open back up, but we're like, well, we have no staff, no supplies, no, like in the meantime, um, the average consumer has just no awareness of just how much the global supply chain is in shambles yeah. and just how bad the staffing industry or the staffing shortages are. And to me, it was just really frustrating to hear people just say, oh, well, if you took care of your people and if you paid them more, they wouldn't have left you. And I was like, I pay my team really well. Something so like it's something literally the most important thing to me yeah. as a business owner is to try to figure out how to take care of my people. So 
Um, we've always paid more to min than minimum wage, but at the same time, like I can, there's only so much margin here of well, what the I economic, the economics yeah. of running a restaurant. I mean, that's the, the beauty of what you've done in exposing the economics behind running a restaurant are how naive the rest of the world is to what it costs to, to, to run a restaurant. You know, and that that's why the restaurant model is broken. That's why your article resonated with so many people. That's why for four years we failed running our restaurant until we, you know, got the advice that we needed on how on what prime costs are, what what a proper food cost is, what's what's weekly inventory. What what do you mean weekly inventory? We have to count everything in this restaurant every single week. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, you 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 do that, but then you you know, all you can do is do your best. And really what you've done by sharing your story is that you've shed light. You know, and I think that's, you know, something that's, it's educational, but it's also probably pretty therapeutic for you to, to sure. talk about your own journey, right? It, it's very cathartic. Um, and I must say 80%, 80, 90% of the response has been extremely positive and people, you know, being very understanding, being, you know, appreciating um, us explaining it and just, you know, giving them a look. Uh, but then there's obviously always going to be that that percentage of people sure. who just think that like we're trying to take advantage or something or that, you know, or like that we're fighting to keep underpaying people. I'm like, no, no, that's like literally the opposite of Correct. what I was just saying. But people are going to spin it and they're going to try to take it in their own. You know, they're just unfortunate that the trolls are out there and it's a good yeah. time it's also it's hard to to put yourself out there and to be vulnerable and to say okay like this is my reality and no matter how you say it they're going to want to attack you and i think that that's what that's the hard part of this is like wow you don't know me and you don't know my staff you don't know my people i've done everything i could during this pandemic to go above and beyond and take care of them um and for some reason it's like the our industry has unjustly gotten a bad rap of just underpaying and like yeah under you know underappreciating i was like wow like since and i know i'm pretty new to this industry but everybody i've met i've never met such like good good-hearted people who care about their teams and like will go to bat for them and they're just saying like oh well that's they're saying like our whole industry is just like that's why we're having so many problems like yeah. if you just took care of them you'd have no problem like literally Think, think about it this way, the government force, like I'm not full service, but I, my, a lot of my friends are. Mm -hmm. So in Canada, we've been shut down four times. Like you just force that, that business owner to fire his staff four times. Correct. Like, and you expect fire them, them, bring them back. Correct. Like wait for you, us, wait for us. And then to you're like, oh, I don't yeah. know why you have staffing or labor problems in your industry. It's like, well, if instead the government has said when there's a shutdown, um, you know, what we'll do, we'll, we'll, give you grants so that you can keep your people employed instead they mm -hmm. said no fire them and then we'll pay them and we'll look yeah. like oh the government saved you it's like no no the government fucked you and then now they're trying to look like heroes and somehow that story is getting spun back on our industry and making to make us look bad and, and like that's what well, that's the, all what kind of got me the thing that i mean that's the thing that i love is that you've become your own media source. And that's really what we advocate is that you become the voice of your village. Like you can only own your truth mm -hmm. and you can own your truth on the internet. You have the courage to publish that truth on the internet. And because you do, you get this incredible overwhelming response. Yes, you're gonna have haters. Like no matter what, you know, you can't get into business and not have people say, oh, you think you've got, you know, great Berlin donor, uh, donor kebabs? Like, no, they're, they're shit. They're nothing compared to what I've had. I mean, we're in the barbecue business in San Diego. Do you know how many people told us we don't know how what we're doing in San Diego that, you know, the Texas barbecue is better, Kansas City barbecue is better. It's like, you have to have that tough skin. What's your uh, advice to somebody that, is, is they want to share their story online. They want to build their business. They want to build a, a stronger community. What's your advice to somebody that is thinking about publishing on the internet? Well, that, that is such a great timely question right now because I'm just literally going through it this week because um, this one's taking off as well. And like, and there's there's so much comments. And like I said, whereas 80, 80 to 90% of it is, is super positive, there's, there's also a very dark side. Mm -hmm. And as much as like literally written in my posts, I try to not give a fuck. And you, you, <laughs> you know, you try to, to pretend that nothing gets to you. And 
in general, I, I have built pretty thick skin, um, but at the end of the day, we're all human. And I can't pretend that there aren't moments where it uh, doesn't upset me. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there's the, in, in my case too, like, so it's funny because at first they just started attacking me personally. And yeah. I was like, okay, whatever. Like you're, you're just, you, you're haters, haters going to hate. You, if you have the time to attack yeah. somebody personally because of what yeah. they wrote or a video that they made or a post that they made about their own personal experience or their own business. I mean, you, you know, there, there's much deeper issues there. Yeah. And they're just taking things from my personal life. that have nothing to do with Correct. any of this and, and using that as ammo. Um, and that was one thing. And I was just like, okay, whatever, fuck them. Um, but now just, just recently today, they started like taking that and started to like bring it onto Google and start bashing a wolf down in my team. So now I'm like, well, that now I'm pissed. Like, yeah, that's not cool. Yeah. I can handle it, but Correct. I'm responsible for my team. And that, and that's when you do start to question, like, is it worth it? Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I will always say yes. I won't be silenced, and I believe in speaking up. And I think that maybe one of the things that was somewhat lost is like, yes, I'm telling my story from my own personal experience, but in that voice is also the stories of all my friends and all the That's all the correct. wonderful people. So it's not just my story. So there's certain things that I'm defending that maybe isn't specifically my case, but I'm I know it's happened to a lot of others. So like my experience is different as a fast casual from a full service and sure. they've gotten it so much worse. So I'm also feel like I, I want to be a voice and I want to defend them and as well. So it's not even like all saying this is me personally, and this is our personal experience. I'm just mm -hmm. feel like the industry as a whole doesn't have enough people speaking up for it. And so for some crazy reason, I decided <laughs> I would try because I, I have such a passion for this industry, but yeah, I mean, at, it also means I'm opening myself up to, to, to be a target. For yeah. Sure. But I'll, you know what, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll take it. Well, I, I hope, I hope that you continue to have the courage because for me, it's inspirational. It's me. It's inspirational to see someone like you publishing content on the internet, telling the truth, you know, telling the truth about your business. And, and because of that, you know, there's so many businesses all across the globe that are in the hospitality business. Like you said, you know, it's easy for the media to report that we're not paying our staff well enough, but you don't get into the hospitality business unless you care about people. Like we care about people through food. Like it, it literally couldn't be a more difficult business to get in when you're talking about people's senses and, you know, making a memorable moment, you know, having someone come into your shop and walk away with them with a memory that they want to go tell someone else about. So for me, I, I hope you continue to lean into that um, despite, you know, the 10% or 15% or 25, whatever, whatever that percentage is. Um, hopefully more people are, are, are encouraged by your voice. And I, uh, I hope people take that away. One of the things we do love to talk about is mentorship. Um, it's mm -hmm. something that I failed at as a, as an early restaurateur, uh, not asking for help more when I should have. And now I'm trying to do a better job and ask people who have been there for directions on how to get there. If they have multiple restaurants, if they're, if they're in podcasts, if they're in media, I'm trying to figure it out. So I don't have to, you know, literally learn how to make the recipe of the sausage myself. <laughs> Somebody's already made the sausage. <laughs> Let's go ask for help. Um, have you had any mentors in your life? Uh, actually, this is so many. This is probably the one area I think I've been the most fortunate. Um, and I know some of that comes from me asking, like me not being afraid to, to ask or to reach out. For some reason, I just knew that that was something that was going to be very important. I always say, looking back on school, the one, the one thing they don't emphasize, but it, it sounds like a cliche line, but like you realize when you get in business, it is a lot about who, you know, um, yeah. they don't teach that at school. You can't teach that at school, but when it's come down to it at the end of the day, I've gotten here all by just connecting with people and working together and making things happen. Um, but in terms of, of mentors, all like actually all of our, investors are, are people that I admire um, in, in different ways, mostly. So I don't know if you know this, but half of our investors are the uh, founders of Shopify, who awesome. are Germans. And, you know, I've heard of Shopify. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> My kids listen are. to Shopify on the way to daycare every morning. <laughs> 
so you know they, they've done all right um yeah. and they just they want a german donor and i was like i think i can do that let's see <laughs> i think i can make that happen i think i, I like, can execute <laughs> yeah and i was like okay i don't know what i'm doing but i like donor too so like so our origin story is super random yeah. um in, in random's that the best i mean why would yeah. why would a barbecue restaurant be in san diego it's a barbecue media company i mean what are you gonna do Ran, exactly. ran, lean into your random lean into your crazy yeah. um and then the other half of our investors are high stakes german poker pros who were also guys i admired you know as i started getting into poker and then became friends with and i mean they'll teach you a thing or two about risk uh, risk <laughs> <laughs> um but also entering this industry knowing nothing um yeah. both here in ottawa so many people stepped up and were just i couldn't believe it. like i i thought like maybe they're not gonna like me because competition and because like who am i to come into this world with nothing and it was the complete opposite yeah. like um you know from steve beck to, to dave siegel to just like everybody just was like how can i help and it was yeah. like wow that's crazy and then same exact experience. I go to Vegas. I'm nobody. I'm not even local. What am I doing? I don't know. Um, but I, I put myself out there, was vulnerable. And, you know, everybody from James Trees, who has like a bunch of amazing restaurants down there to call in Fukunaga, Fuku Burger, they're just like, yeah, let's meet up. Like, what do you need? Wow. And that is like one of the coolest things about this industry. It's, I've already made, like, just met the most amazing people and made really great friends and contacts and that that's the story that you, you never see and I, I've been in other industries and it's just there's nothing quite like um the hospitality industry which probably like you said probably for obvious reasons but mm -hmm. you you really see that it's it's not about the competition so much as the collaboration yeah and, and that's what's what's really cool we really are do feel like we're in this together so I mean my mentor list is like way too long to even <laughs> to even start. So I, I'm very, very fortunate in that regard. Yeah, I love that. It was for for us, you know, I, I say that people gave us a hard time about barbecue and that that's just the, the consumer. But mm -hmm. when you think about when we started going into Kansas City Barbecue Society and National Barbecue Society, once they realized how serious we were about the craft of barbecue, it was always how can I help? You know, yeah. and like that that's part of the hospitality, that's part of the restaurant business. And it's something that hopefully anybody that's listening to this podcast, they if they're thinking about opening up a restaurant, know that you're not alone. Like there's plenty of us that have gone out there and tried to do it ourselves. But, you know, it doesn't matter what village you're in, what city you're in, what country you're in. There's somebody out there and restaurant people are some of the best people on earth. And if if they see how serious you are, they're more than willing to help. Right. Like and that that's something that somehow it seems so obvious to me and is, is not well understood that, like you said, no one gets into this restaurant and biz, business just like, cause like they think it's a good way to make money. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> like, it's not a quick way to make it. No, like, and that's what, that's what one yeah. of the things that just drives me insane when people say that, like kind of pin it on like, oh, you're just greedy or something. I'm like, seriously, seriously. <laughs> wow. Um, and so like everybody, we're all doing it from a place of just passion for whether it's food in general or a specific type of food, or it's, it's creating experience for people. Like that's why we, that's why we do it. And, um, I just wish there was more appreciation for that. Even, even in my case, I'm a white girl doing Turkish German cuisine. Um, and We've even gotten it attacked because in Germany, it's mostly only Turkish mom and pops that do this. So people come in or like, so we've been attacked by being like, well, you're not Turkish. And I was like, oh, like, yeah, am I not allowed? Yeah. And this whole, this, like, that's the other kind of discussion that we're facing a lot right now is this whole idea of authenticity and cultural appropriation and mm -hmm. I'm just like, you can't win guys. Like I'm just trying to, to do a good thing here. I'm trying to bring good food. Um, yeah. And the kicker of this is that it's usually like the most random people or like other white people that are calling me out on this. Yeah. And I'm like, but we have Turkish customers and they fucking love us. Like, so like, they're not even offended. We're just trying to we're embracing this and 
that's a whole a whole other discussion so just like you all this to say you know it's it's a tough industry and i it's a tough industry you need tough skin but I mean, ultimately you're leaning into your truth. You know, it's one of my things, you know, my, my media mentor, David Meltzer, he teaches me that truth vibrates the fastest. And as you can tell from, you know, the content that you're putting out, the food that you're putting out, the quality, you wouldn't have people buying in. You wouldn't have investors wanting to give you guys money, believing in opening it up more shops if, if you weren't, you know, true to your word. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, one of the, the things that we love to talk about is technology. Um, obviously, Toast is our primary point of sale partner. They're sponsoring this podcast. Um, you know, we needed an online ordering during the pandemic, and we switched over to Toast, and it really helped us in our operations. Is there any technology that you guys are currently using that has been a, a help to you during the pandemic or during your operations? Um, you know, I'll be I'll be very honest, and this is a, another controversial one, but um, we basically have surviving the pandemic we basically owe that to oh, uber eats and oh i love that no i read your article about that yeah. please tell me more about uber eats because um, because it's easy to find the narrative about how bad third-party delivery is but you won't hear that from us and i'd love to hear it from you yeah so the reality is um especially during covid there's people that cannot get to us. We, our location is not easy to park at. Um, some people don't have cars. People were stuck in quarantine. Like as much as you want to say, like, like you hear people are like, don't be lazy, go to the restaurant, support directly. Like it's just not possible for some people. No. So that's, that's one end. Plus there's people that literally just discovered us because they're scrolling through that app. So Correct. it's also, it's also a massive marketing channel for us. Um, and because we put out quality, we're always kind of top eight. So we do get a lot of visibility. Um, and when you hear people saying like, well, for what they, what they charge for it, you know, is it worth it? And I, I did the math on like what it would cost me to try to do all of these deliveries, not to mention just from a pure logistics perspective, Correct. there's no way I could do this. We do 2,500 to 3,000 deliveries a month there's yeah. no way I can it's do that possible. my car like it's not going to happen and not I couldn't even do that with my own delivery person because it's not a constant demand it's not like every 10 minutes we have an order it's like 6 p.m there's 12 orders at once right. and I need 12 drivers at my doorstep in five minutes so like it or not the reality is that they've enabled us to keep getting our food to as many if not more people yeah and all of this is going down. No, I really and, appreciate you saying that. It's it's very yeah. important because I mean that that's why we love technology so much is because it forces the restaurant business to think like an e-commerce company. I mean, we can't discriminate how people get our barbecue in San Diego. Before mm -hmm. it was build this great barbecue restaurant that everyone's going to drive 45 minutes across town to come line up for an hour, you know, to buy brisket, but that doesn't make sense. Like Amazon Prime has changed that, you know, yeah. technology has changed how we get things. And, you know, as a, as a dad of a four-year-old and a two-year-old, sometimes we don't have time to cook. After a busy day at work, we don't have time to cook. And guess what? We're going to get Uber Eats or we're going to get DoorDash. Will we support a local restaurant? Yeah, probably we will. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's going to be convenience. So I, I appreciate you not only talking about that, but writing about that because it is it is super important. Is there anything that you do um, recently, personally or in business, the, any kind of habit that you've implemented that's made an impact on you? Ooh. A habit. Um... I am a, a not, nothing that's new. I'm, I'm pretty much a creature of habit. So I, <laughs> you're a creature of habit. So how about um, any 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 habit that's helped you um, as you've become a restaurant owner? Any anything that that might be a little bit unconventional? Oh wow! I wish I was prepared for this one. Um, I feel like everything we do is a little bit unconventional, but. Um, One thing we we stand we've always stood by is trying to do one thing really well, and and that's I love that yeah it's a double edged sword because you you know a lot of places try to do everything and try to do it all, um, so we are known for having one of the smallest menus in the city, and most people love that they actually come in and you know they're like wow you've made my life easier by not having to make these decisions and I'm like. 
always the one that has like analysis paralysis and just like can't make up my mind um, when with big menus. So that's something that we're kind of challenged on all the time because there's always all these opportunities to, oh, why don't you add this? Why don't you add that? And we were very selective of like, okay, we'll do this one LTO just, you yeah. know, to, to do something fun on the side, but trying to stick, stay true to what we stand for um, at this, like standing our ground on that. It's, it's a tricky balance, but that's not really Yeah, bad. no, that, that, that's great advice. It's something that we learned after 13 years, we've simplified our menu more than it ever has. And just because yeah. you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And if I could go back and tell myself, you know, to lean into barbecue way back when we first started, um, that would be the advice that I would give myself. So um, what's the best place for people to connect with you um, at the restaurant? Where in Vegas and um, where, where are the locations? Yeah, so um, in Ottawa, we are right downtown in uh, on Bank Street. In Vegas, we are actually unconventionally placed in Koreatown, um, right on Spring Mountain Road. So that's a pretty uh, busy plaza that a lot of people know. There's a lot of good spots on there. It's kind of anchored by Golden Tiki and um, so some really, really cool spots in there. Uh, for myself, connecting, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. Perfect. We'll put Find links, me. we'll put links in the show notes. Um, and Wolf Down is the brand. Um, absolutely love the branding. I'm a little bit biased. My last name means wolf in Bulgarian. So we have our, our Walchef Wolf Pack, our little, our little family here, but I love all the branding. I'm probably going to go on your website and buy some swag and get it sent out to us because uh, we love what you guys are doing. Super cool. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hook you up. Just let me know. <laughs> if you guys uh, want to reach out to me, it's at Sean P. Walchef on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn. Those are the primary playgrounds. If you want to learn more about the show, it's Restaurant Influencers dot media if you want to nominate somebody to be on the show if somebody is doing a great job on instagram if they're doing a great job podcasting if they're on snapchat whatever they're doing for the restaurant if there's an app on the smartphone that they're telling their story um, and you found them and you think that they'd be a great guest on the show please reach out to us um, thanks again to toast um, our primary point of sale partner for putting this podcast together and thank you for your time we're su super grateful joe i hope you publish more on medium and i hope you publish on, on more platforms because the world needs your voice i i really appreciate that it means a lot on restaurant influencers you will learn how to share your brand story online from the best smartphone storytellers in the restaurant and hospitality space Powered by Entrepreneur Media and Yelp, our weekly show will explore the creator economy ecosystem so that you can find opportunities for your food business to grow. Thanks to Toast, our primary technology partner at Cali Barbecue Media, for not only sponsoring this show, but for helping restaurants become digital first businesses. If you want to learn more about why we switched from Aloha to Toast after 12 years in business and how Toast can help your restaurant become a digital first restaurant, please send us a DM today at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. Thank you.